Welcome. Um, I'm Swati Desai. I am on the advisory board of Samanwe. Samanwe is a platform organization uh, which regularly showcases cultural and art events from India. It's dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and appreciation of Indian art and literature. We organize cultural and literary events to showcase world-class Indian talents, as well as we support local and upcoming artists. We contextualize performances and events, and we provide orientation to various traditions of arts and literature with the goal of creating active audience and communities in India. We strategically plan cultural events and with the aim to create a space of engagement between artists, thought leaders, audiences, collaborators, stakeholders, and patrons of Indian arts to promote both creation and appreciation of Indian arts and thought, both in India and abroad. So that's what Samanwe is about. And today we are going to have this event called Living Ancient Art of India. And I'm very excited to welcome Debashish Banerjee, Professor Banerjee and Vikram Dutsi. What we are going to do is we are going to first showcase the film that both of them have produced. Vikram is the director of the film and Debashish is a, a co-producer and art historian of the film. I would like to introduce Debashish and Vikram first before we actually show the film. Debashish and Vikram, both of them, one thing I want to say about them is they're true people. And what do I mean by true people? That they live their profession. They are in the flow of what they do. Vikram is a journalist as well as a filmmaker. And he has a regular column. He writes about art, religion, politics, and all kinds of subjects. He is extremely devoted to his type of thinking, which we will see in the film that we are going to do, uh, we are going to show. Debashish also is a same type of person who is in flow with his profession. Debashish is a professor, a chaired professor in California Institute for Integral Studies where he specializes in Indian art, philosophy, Asian art as well. He has a PhD in art history from UCLA. And since that time, he has had an illustrious career of authoring books, as well as working on various projects that involve, as I said, ancient art history, as well as modern art from India. I have to say that he's one person I know who's encyclopedia of this kind of knowledge. I have worked with both Debashish and Vikram on some projects. As a result, I can truly say that they are both true people. So that's what I call them. So now the film that we are going to show is called Darshan. I don't want to say too much about the film because you're actually going to see it. So first of all, to the audience, I would like to say, just notice the stunning colors, the art forms, and just the visual aspect of this film. That's the first layer. That's the first thing you're going to see. And then see how deep you want to go and understand what's being shown in the film. And then we'll talk about it. So let's go. Amit, can you start the film? Visitors to museums often forget that the art they see in the museum collections belong to living religions and not dead ones. And so they still have meaning and can be used in their original context. Making a drawing by a painter, a sketch by a painter, 
and the sketch by a sculptor is completely different. The painter's idea is it is a three-dimensional, okay. But he has to put it in the two dimension and he has to create the illusion of the three dimension. Vishagarmas are always using the practical side of it, utility side of the sketch. Paintings like this were made by artists who serviced the temple for all its painting needs and who produced such paintings for pilgrims who came and uh, went away with paintings like this. Today, these artists are still there. It's another living community. The Jagannath ka jo kam hota hai, hamar traditional, bahut din se hai, bahut purana hai. Totally stunning. Yeah. It's totally stunning. Oh, look at that. And that was the first time I saw them, and I fell in love with them. They're because they're beautiful. They're unashamedly beautiful. वो छोटा लेकिन कारगर हथियार है. This is actually frames, but we convert into uh, motif styles. This is for the data, 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 for I think this is uh, for life. Without uh, art, no life. Without life, no art. Amoda manove jati yagmaye sontan. Amoda hula manove jati yagmaye sontan. I think I I will introduce Dabashish and Vikram again just with one line, only because some people probably join afterwards. So. For their sake, Vikram is the director of this movie, who is a journalist who writes about art, religion, and he's also a filmmaker from UCLA. His film, Max Kennedy, uh, Max Kennedy and the American Dream is available on the OTT platform. And it's a very well-known documentary about the Mexican-American border issue. Uh, Debashish is an art scholar, art historian, a professor of Asian art history in California Institute for Integral Studies, where East and West truly meets in Northern California. Vikram right now is tucked away in Mexico because of lockdown and is enjoying his quiet time. And right now, however, he is not enjoying because of the way the movie was uh, uh, did not see that was. I'm very, very sorry about that, Vikram, and I hope that you still talk to us and uh, tell us a little bit about the movie to give a sense to the audience uh, for what they could not see. Um, so I would like to actually begin by asking Debushish. First of all, before I begin, the, I want to say one thing. The movie had, had three layers. The first layer was that these art objects they were all religious. They were ancient art objects made by artists who are currently living. So the first layer was that of just the beauty of the art itself. So collectors and museums, they would keep that art. The second layer was the artists who were making it for years and years, years, they have been making this kind of art. And the third layer was that of darshan which is the devotee, the temple going person who goes there and actually sees this object and builds a relationship with the object. There is an encounter that they experience. And so there are these three layers. So first of all, let me clarify one thing from Debashish. Debashish, why did you want to term it living ancient art? Living ancient art, uh, living and ancient kind of don't go together, these two words. And so I'm curious to know what you meant by that. So Swati, um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge here the presence of Dr. Pratapaditya Pal. He's okay. in our audience. He was uh, the curator of the show on which this film was based and also a major commentator and advisor for the film. Yes. Uh, uh, the, 
living ancient art because uh, the forms and the techniques are ancient, but it's coming down to our time and also living ancient art because nothing really remains still. It's, it's alive and uh, we can see how in many ways we are the people who bring it to life. It's living in many ways today as it never lived in its earlier time. So it's, it's living in, in all these senses. Okay. okay, so my next question is to you and Vikram both. Vikram, are you there? I'm not sure if Vikram is there. Yes, He's I'm here. Yes, okay. yes right. I'm okay. here. All right. Okay. Yeah. So um, my question to you both is, why did you decide to make this movie? In fact, before this question, I want to ask you a personal question. Okay. And don't worry, it's not personal. As in, I'm not going to ask you about relationships and things like that. I'm not Barbara Walters. However, what I want to know is, are you... I don't know the, what the right word is. Are you believers? Do you experience whatever you showed in the movie yourself? And that will lead us to why did you want to make this movie? Vikram, you want to say something? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, when you ask me, am I a believer? Um, I have to wonder, you know, what is the context of that? Because when you say belief, how exactly do you define belief? You know, in our system, uh, when you look at our, uh, the, the six darshanas that we have in Hinduism, um, you know, we are asked to adhere to a very rigorous, uh, process of elimination and logic and it's an empirical process to a large degree so I come at it from there you know, because um, the term believer is more of an Abrahamic construct uh, where, uh, where you surrender before uh, certain do's and don'ts certain injunctions that are carved in stone, you know, given out by a prophet, as in, in, in uh, the Abrahamic texts. So, um, so in that respect, I'm not a believer. I, I like to use my critical faculties and I don't uh, blindly uh, believe anything or join the herd. Um, you know, having said that, in my, uh, my, my exploration into uh, Asian metaphysics and Hindu and Buddhist philosophy, uh, they have impressed on me the value of empirical investigation, you know, intellectual investigation into the claims made in, in, in our texts. And that is what, when you find, uh, when, you, when you go through Hinduism and Buddhism, especially, you know, you find the belief component that is at the, there is a hierarchy and the belief component is the one that's most similar to uh, Semitic uh, cults or belief systems. When, when you ascend that and you find that this is a rigorous process of deconstruction that is contained you know, in our uh, texts, whether it's the texts of Advaita, Vedanta, from Vishishta Advaita. Um, and I don't want to go into the arcane aspects into too much detail, but belief is not uh, something, you're not faced with that conundrum. You know, when you go deeply into these, these, uh, these knowledge systems. So, uh, so I came at it from there. And, uh, and, 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 and there is, a, if you even follow the logical path, uh, there is a lot, uh, there is a lot of profound wisdom. And um, even in terms of pure philosophy, 
so but we find that indian philosophy and ancient philo- and, and eastern philosophies often um compartmentalized as religion when when in the study of philosophy in the academy you know so these are almost uh, relegated to the field of religion and not taken seriously as philosophy in many but that's changing slowly of course when you see how rigorous uh, you know the argumentation the process of argumentation and empirical deconstruction is in arriving at these truths so when you say it's a truth claim you know that does not apply here because a truth claim is like scientology you know a truth claim is what moses on the hill you know a truth claim is any of the texts that are attached to abrahamic systems but in yogic systems and in tantric systems there are no truth claims there are some but then within the system they are ridiculed by thinkers and intellectuals within hinduism and buddhism mm-hmm. you know so the process is so rigorous that anything that does not meet those standards is eliminated like junk literally you know so um coming to your uh, you know coming to your question about whether i'm a believer uh uh now in the classical sense i'm not because i don't you know visit temples and i don't uh participate in in mass rituals uh sometimes i do uh like for this making in the making of this film i attended uh, a, a number of rituals then within my own family also and out of my own interest i have participated in initiated certain rituals uh where i sense a certain shamanic element there you know um the capacity to alter reality in a way but if you go into it from that uh you know from a very uh, from that circumscribed in that circumscribed manner where you go in and you're asking for whether the muslims call it mannat you know and the hindus call it whatever it is that they call it but it's always asking for something in return for your prayers and your devotion whether it's a good life or good fortune or material success or whatever it may be so the way of the shaiva is very different you know the way of the shaiva monk is very different they they're not or, or even if you go into the buddhist pantheon they're not asking for for a, uh, you know for for a, for a return for dividends you know asking for dividends though some hindus very much are into that mode of thinking so for all practical purposes today just to cut it short hinduism is an organized religion okay it's used as an as an instrument of state power we have drifted light years away from the essence and the epistemic meaning of these uh profound and dizzying uh you know experiments in thought and consciousness so what it is today is no different from how islam or christianity are practiced in the mainstream and so, very easy to manipulate these people yeah. uh in, into an agenda into a state agenda into a state uh, you know uh, dictated kind of campaign so to whatever end it may be vikram i so this I, is my answer yeah yeah okay so so i so yeah, i mean everything you said i mean you are very passionate about this subject obviously and i what i got from you as an answer to my question is it's not that you you are not a religious person you are not a god believer maybe you are an agnostic but you do believe in thinking and analyzing things and to you it seems like the religious experience that the darshan part that is described in this film you are saying a lot of times that just you know sort of pushed away as oh that just religion but you are bringing in some logic or something to it is that what it is you are trying to examine that yes. for you it is the yeah. thinking part of you that's viewing this darshan which may or may not be coming from the thinking so called uh, thinking and if you have to differentiate yeah. thinking and religion but debashish what was your your i mean how did this movie come about partly the movie came about 
in response to the exhibition that we begin talking about mm -hmm. uh, that was called Puja and Piety mm -hmm. and uh, exhibited in, in uh, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that exhibition in itself was trying to, to some extent, problematize the way in which we treat religious art. So religious art, which is that there are standard objects that are actually shown in museums and they become standalone objects of aesthetic uh, contemplation or aesthetic enjoyment. While here the, the notion was that the high and the low have to be collapsed. Aestheticism in the Indian context means something else. Mm -hmm. It means what we are calling darshan. In other words, the experience of visually med mediated exchange with, uh, with, the, with, with religion or with the gods. So that was what it was. And so from there to take it into, into the living context to show how it's actually done right now today by artists, what are their feelings and what are their experiences in making these things? and also how they are consumed, how, the, how are things changing? Uh, that was the motive behind it. Okay. And so uh, in a way it was a variety. I, we wanted to actually study the field and see the variety of responses that came from this, the very variety of traditions that had already been shown in the, in the uh, ex exhibition. So we explored those. Yes, yes. I did see that exhibition that you're referring to, and I'm so honored that Dr. Paul is attending this uh, event. And I'm so sorry, Dr. Paul, that you couldn't see the movie properly. And hopefully we'll make it available on YouTube, post this at least for some time for those people to see it. Uh, so I did see that exhibition where uh, I heard his uh, interview afterwards and uh, so I'm aware of that exhibition that started this thought of making this movie. To me, it seems like what you're, one point that you're making is that the difference between Western art, art and Eastern art is also that the Eastern art tends to be darshan centric. So uh, Swati, I'd say, uh, again, when we say Eastern and Western, uh, you know, it's liable to be misunderstood because the West had its own darshan centric art as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think what is happening with modernity is that we've got two different ways of looking at visual objects. One is we categorize it as religion or we categorize it as folk art or craft. And the other is we consume it as art. In other words, it becomes collected, put into museums, viewed with the, with, the, with the motive of enjoyment, aesthetic enjoyment. While here, the motive is quite different. The motive is exchange with the divine. Mm -hmm. And so the experience is very different. And that is what we were trying to uh, investigate. Yeah, okay. So uh, as, you, as we are talking, there are a couple of comments here that I would like to read out. By the way, if you have questions, I will give you a chance to actually talk to either the Bashish or Vikram. But meanwhile, you can also write your comments or questions. That will be great too. So um, one thing that Fazia is saying, something about what Vikram said, that Hinduism is becoming something like an Abrahamic religion. So she's agreeing with Vikram on that level. Then there is someone else who is saying, who's asking you, Vikram, something that was said in the movie, but I guess it wasn't heard properly, is the gazing into the eyes of gods or goddess, goddesses or losing of the self. That's what Lisa, I think this is Lisa, she's asking Vikram, is the gazing into the eyes of gods, goddesses, a losing of the self. And maybe uh, Vikram, if you understand this question, I'll let you answer it. Otherwise, maybe I'll ask Lisa to actually say it the way she wants to uh, articulate it. Do you want to say that? Uh, do you want to uh, give the answer to this question, Vikram? Yeah, it's a very interesting question mm -hmm. uh, because you know what is losing the self and what is the self. So let's talk about that. 
Um, according to Buddhist doctrine, there is no such thing as a fixed self. And according to Hindus, uh, the self is eternal. And the self is a substrate of all manifested being called Brahman. Now, Buddhists do not, uh, do not acknowledge such a thing, such a notion. But if you look at certain Mahayana, uh, you look at Mahayana and Tibetan sects, you know, they talk about things like the Dharmakaya, you know, which is very similar uh, to, to what we call the, dharma, the Brahman. So, so many people are now saying that it's, the Buddha did not actually negate the self. The Buddha was uh, actually, there was a silence when he was asked, is there a self? And then that silence was then, uh, there was a whole intellectual debate that followed that silence, which is still continuing to this day. Essentially, that as soon as you try to grasp the self with the mind, it disappears. So the exercise itself is futile because when you put a label on it, the object of your investigation slips out of your grasp. You know? So that is where you have the Zen school arrived from that, from that understanding. So anyway, yeah. uh, coming to your about mm -hmm. the self and this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, gazing into the, 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 the deity. So Hindus have, uh, you know, uh, what is known as uh, the subject object duality in physics. And uh, when you are the subject and uh, the deity is the object of your perception, uh, there is a process of apprehending that deity. You know, when now, now, so there is a three stage process between us and the world that we apprehend through our senses. Okay, I, I, am, I am the subject uh, uh, through my senses. I am cognizant of the object. Okay, I'm having darshan of the object through the medium of space and time and my senses. Now, when we talk about losing the self, it means merging with the with the object and being one with the object where the differentiation disappears between the object and the subject. So this is discussed in great detail in modern uh, quantum physics. And there have been studies and analogies of quantum physics and a certain Hindu cosmologies. I don't want to go into that, but yeah. So basically to answer Lisa's question, that's what it boils down to is that uh, subsuming those, the discrete functions of cognition into the experience of darshan, which is Advaita, which is non-divisible. So there, in that we call uh, the, the, you know, that is, that is the, the, the moment uh, the non-divisible moment. So Vikram, uh, one of the things that it reminds me of in the last part of the film, where you go to Nepal and you talk to the person, Lok Chitrakar, who started this school to revive the ancient Buddhist art of painting. So he thinks about this art as it's like a meditation. And it is, he says that it is understanding yourself better. And then in the end, he says, it's losing your ego, it's losing yourself. So that is the way he describes actually making of this art, not so much even the darshan, but just the making of the art. Right. So when you were talking about, and yes, the self in Buddhism and all that, we can talk about it for hours. But I have a question to Debashish. And by the way, I'm reading all the questions. I'll let all of you ask your questions to, to these people. But let me get a couple of things clarified first. So Debashish, I have a question for you. When you look, okay, so you went to all these different places. You went to Jagannath Puri. And then you talked to the artists in the small village, Chitrakar. 
Then you went to Tamil Nadu, where they make the Chola period bronze statues. They are Vishwakarma. That's the so-called the caste in a way. It's a caste. Yes. Right. And then from there, you also went to Rajasthan. And they had their own caste where they were making their own type of paintings. Then you went to Nepal. And so you went to these places, four different places. In fact, there was a fifth place you also went to. Um, given these, all these different places you went to, what were the similarities and are, what were the differences between the way you saw this phenomenon of darshan happening, as well as the way you saw the artists who were working in these different places working? Well, for one, that they, they're using similar forms and they're actually using practices which have a lot of similarity. Uh, I mean, the media are the same, but I think the, the, the fundamental thing that is the same is the attitude they have to the art, which is the attitude of devotion. You saw that yes. in all the cases that, you know, whether it's the modern people, like you, the one that you missed was Auroville, and we, we yeah. were showing somebody modern, which is also a living part of this ancient art. Yeah. You see that uh, Western people, who have actually assimilated into the tradition mm -hmm. and are also changing it because there are, I, I don't know how, mon, how many of you noticed that actually what she was producing was not necessarily Hindu art. It was hybrid art. She mm -hmm. was doing what she wanted. And, but the attitude was the same and there were experiences that came from it. Like she was saying right in the beginning that a golden light emanated from this image. Mm. So these kinds of experiences uh, are really uh, at the heart of a relationship with the divine that is the common thing in all these practices that we saw. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's, that was one thing. The devotion, the devotional aspect was the common thing. Right. However, I'm wondering because... And it's, it's also, Swati, when we use the word devotion again, we are liable to mistake it with what we call devotion in the West, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is piety. Mm -hmm. And piety is an aspect. That's why the exhibition was called Puja and Piety. Mm -hmm. But devotion or bhakti is also very close to another Indian term, bhukti. They have mm -hmm. similar roots, which mm -hmm. means enjoyment. Mm -hmm. There's a full-bodied enjoyment of this, mm -hmm. of this process. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is these states of non-duality that Vikram was talking about, mm -hmm. that the entire so-called devotion merges into union. You see, yes. that's, what it's, that's what's behind it. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, quite a unique experience in, yes. this, in this whole setup. Yes, so that's what you mean by devotion. Uh, yes. And also I saw that there was different variations of it in the three layers you talked about. One is the devotee herself or himself, what they have in their aspirational, in their aspirations. There is certain devotion that they have towards the image that they are gazing at, maybe losing of self or not. Then there is a collector. And the collector also, I would say to a certain degree, is devotion, is showing devotion. So the woman in Santa Barbara, Julia, right? So right. who's a collector, she's a Western woman who collects Indian art. She talked about spiritual experience when she That's had right. this art, right? And then there are the artists themselves and they are so, I mean, I was amazed. They have been doing it for generations after generations after generations. They have such sense of pride and such sense of like getting dissolved into the making of these uh, artifacts. Like, am I right in my observation yeah. in indeed the indeed you're you're right swati and that was also part of the aim of uh, of the, of the of the film which is that uh, you know we can take things in a stereotypical fashion that and say that collectors collect art for investment for example or for personal enjoyment right mm -hmm. uh, but even in those areas, that's part of the living uh, sense of the art. The, the, there can be another kind of experience. Some people collect because they get a devotional experience out of it. 
Mm. And that's what we were seeing with this person. Yeah, so it was darshan in a lot of different ways. Yes, I can darshan see why in a lot of different it, ways. Yeah, exactly. I can see why you called it darshan. Okay, so the other question I have, and then I'm going to turn the mic to the audience. The other question I have is, um, you are talking about the three religions, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain, Jainism, right? In the Indian context. How about any other religion? I also saw amazing thing that there was some Muslim artist. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, indeed. I mean, and so this was in the village of Noya in Bengal. And these uh, artists have been practicing there for a long time. And they are uh, like minstrels. They travel, they go from village to village with stories. So these are storytelling paintings and they'll sing the song and show various objects in the painting. And th that's how they made a living. They never sold the paintings. They sold their singing. Mm. But now, of course, they're selling the paintings as well. And these people are Muslims. So I've, I've actually built a long-term relationship with some of these people. Uh, the, the one family we were hi highlighting. Uh, and the first time I met him, I actually asked him the question that, you know, in many places in Islam, uh, painting of living objects are, is, is uh, prohibited because it's in the hadith. Uh, and so I said, is there any uh, difficulty that you experience with painting these things? And he was absolutely uh, consternated. He said, uh, nobody told us that. In other words, uh, you know, they practice yeah. their own yeah. kind of Islam. And mm. for them, these are all forms of the divine. Mm. So I think at a certain level, at this level, you find, and we end with that. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, song also got chopped off in the mm. viewing. Mm. Mm. Uh, right at the end, uh, there is an entire song, which uh, this uh, uh, Chitrakar from Noya is singing and showing the, the painting. It's about the the... the uh, identity of all religions mm -hmm. so uh you know that's how they treat this uh, this kind of thing at, yeah. at, at that level yeah. yeah that's amazing and i also am noticing one thing to a certain degree it seems like the living ancient art is it about keeping the tradition alive because in the west the art is always trying to push boundaries it's trying to make some person-centric political statement, so to speak. But in this case, this ancient living art seems like they are keeping the tradition from 12th century or before, like 2000 years tradition alive. Even the caste system of who the painters are, even that is alive. How was that for you? <laughs> Yeah, Swati, I think uh, another point that we're trying to make with the film is that that mm -hmm. is not universally true. Okay. If you noticed, you have some people who are maintaining caste and some people who are not, like the Muslims, for example. Yeah. So there's an entire, and you also have Western people who are learning and furthering the art. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea is that yes and no. There are people who are trying to be very traditional about it. They maintain that, like the Uriya artist, who is saying that uh, my caste was made for this. You know, he's mm. proud about his caste. Yes. And you know, we were made for this. Nobody else has this privilege. And we actually couldn't show, you know, Vikram and I went to a, a, a craft village in, in South India where there's a school, a Gurukula. And mm. they're also very puristic about the maintaining the caste and they feel that that caste which is actually a kind of an outcast is really the central caste because without them god cannot take birth and we could see the competition between the artists and the priests because when we ask them is doesn't the priest do a ritual to bring life into the image he said the priest knows nothing <laughs> we are the ones who bring life into the image <laughs> so you see, there is a certain, there was, that was one side. These people are actually lower caste people, but they consider themselves to be traditional and they're very invested in their tradition. So that is one uh, way in which it continues to maintain the ancient. But there are many others, like in Calcutta, they've completely changed that whole idea. 
to make creative images of Durga. Every image of Durga is different and they are interpreting it. Okay. And then in Noya, you have this other kind of, you know, multi-caste uh, attitude towards it. And then you have foreigners who are taking it into the modern world. So I think uh, there, there is an entire spectrum from trying to continue something which is really ancient and maintain it in its purity to something which is exploring its outer limits. Yes. So I also, what you are saying, and I guess I got that from the film also, to a certain degree, there are changes that are happening or keep happening in, in spite of the traditions being alive, like the Westerners coming and actually making that art. A few of them you showed, uh, as well as even within our community, even amongst Indians, some people are interpreting it instead of just right. keeping the tradition alive. And... Uh, so there are the, both these streams going on in Darshan. Yes. Debashish and Vikram, now I'm going to ask the audience because the audience is very active and I think they're dying to ask you guys questions. And I'm going to ask Michael to actually speak and talk to Vikram because he has a lot of questions. Before I do that, Michael, let me read out a couple of things. Uh, Artrey is saying, amazing resource. Thanks for such a great curated initiative, amazing documentation. That's towards you, Debashish and Vikram. And she's also saying uh, something else, but that needs to be discussed. So I will let her speak it. Pawan is also saying absolutely an eye opener, Vikram, fantastic approach and understanding. Fazia is also trying to, and there is a deep discussion going on amongst our audience about the content of what you guys are saying. Um, so I'm going to ask Michael, would you like to ask your question to Vikram? And if so, then I will unmute you, Michael, or you can probably unmute yourself. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Namaskar, Hi. everyone. Thank you, Vikram, for this amazing movie. Um, <laughs> nice to see you. Do you hear me, everyone? Yeah, yes. I hear you, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I don't have a, a question. I was just thinking about, like, in the West, it took us so many hundreds of years to detach art from Christianity. Um, <clears throat> And once this happened, like a few hundred years ago, um, we could advance our art because it was not um, considered holy or sacred anymore. But um, I think what I have seen in India is that the entire art is, has always been connected to spirituality. And this is why it was so difficult for artists to do modifications of, of the, the way goddesses and gods were depicted. But, but actually this is just my opinion and it's not a real question. What, what I was wondering is that Vikram and Debajish, what, what you were thinking is, I mean, like how, was, how were the deities created if you, and I mean created in a, in a way that were they first seen by the rishis or were they first created in art and by looking at them, gazing at them, um, they became real in the human mind matrix. Um, because I'm sometimes wondering where these deities are really stored. I mean, where do they live? Mm. They must have, they must occupy a certain space because the way the artists painted a Chinamasta or, 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 or any, any of these gods and go goddesses, they must rest somewhere. I mean, they can, they can in some way appear in front of you. They can become alive, but after they become alive, they have, to, they have an, another thing to do. So... So the way we, 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 we paint a Kali or, or a Shiva, I mean, they are always shown in a certain moment of time, <laughs> in a certain action. 
And I, I was just wondering how did it really happen in the beginning yeah. of Indian history? Yeah. Um, how, when was the first, I mean, it's a question of the egg and uh, the, the, how you say, we have this saying in, in Europe, you know, what was first here, was the hen or the egg? Yeah, but, so, so, yeah. Um, so Michael, I'm going to ask Debashish to answer this question. It's a really interesting question. What came first, Debashish? <laughs> if I knew the answer to that, I would know what came first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Vikram, do you have an answer as a filmmaker? <laughs> you mean the images? How did they arise? The images that we worship today. He's, he's, That's saying, your question, right? he's saying, no. did Rishi see it first or did the artist see it first? No, no, no. What, I, what I mean, because, you know, uh, Vikram, I told you that I repainted the Mahavidyas. And when I repainted them, I was just wondering how they came up with the selection of the tools and the weapons and, and, and the hand postures. I mean, how it must have been, because today, the Indians just worship them as they are. They do not double think. I mean, they don't, they don't ask themselves why does Tara has a Cicero or why, you know, I, and because I redid them, I thought about, I mean, why they came up with these ideas from, who, from where it originated. Was the vision first, the, 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 the like the, Paranormal. Yeah, let me let me try to yeah let me try to answer you, that. You know what I mean? Yes. So so this is not about any great vision or you know Moses on a hill receiving a vision from the Almighty. It's not like that at all. It's a very uh, uh, prosaic explanation. Um, so uh, you know uh, Hinduism is born from uh, what we call Hinduism today with the temples and the sacrificial altar and uh, even uh, the mantras, even though it's become a devotional activity for the large part, uh, uh, and it's a bhakti inflected uh, religion that we have in South, in South Asia, in India especially. And you see that bhakti, uh, you see that in, uh, at Christian sites and at Islamic sites in India. It's the same sensibility going in. You will not recognize the difference between a Hindu worshiper or uh, a Catholic at Mount Mary's church in Bandra or uh, you know, a Muslim going to the Ajmer Sharif in, in, in Ajmer or numerous such places. So it's a bhakti inflected religion that we have in India across religions, okay? It's bhakti. This is the underlying uh, emotion. Um, it's not like the Abrahamics in India worship as they do in uh, Schenectady, New York. Okay, it's not that. The, 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 the Christians in India worship as the Hindus do in their temples. So coming to your question about the images, you know, um, we had uh, early tantric uh, cults and these were animistic. And these were uh, born from nature and observations and realizations. And when you see the, the, the early uh, drawings, the tantric drawings, uh, which later became more sophisticated yantras and mandalas, uh, these are aniconic. Okay, these are aniconic. They are not anthropomorphic. And, uh, and deeply symbolic. These are aids, visual aids for meditation and to deconstruct, actually disassemble and reassemble reality as it were from the meta to the micro. So uh, this is what, you know, and the devis and the goddesses are representations of these shaktis contained in these yantras. So these are shaktis of deconstruction, of disassembling what is uh, known as maya. Now, you know, we understand that there are different types of aspirants, spiritual aspirants in different planes. You know, some are at a different level, others are at a more advanced place. And they have to grapple with their own challenges. But devotion is seen as the most, is, is the, uh, what we call the user-friendly road, you know, to, to, to some spiritual 
realization or experience. And um, uh, so these images that you see today of Ganesh and Kali and all these are just simply uh, people who uh, wanted to create something that the human mind could latch on to for the purposes of devotion, that's all. Okay, now let's represent this, uh, you know, this energy or this concept as this dark-skinned woman with so many arms and each arm holds a certain weapon which symbolizes a certain aspect of that meditative practice. You know, so it's like that. And then it got watered down and what you see today is like a Bollywood type of Hinduism which is, you know, as you can see, so, it's very much inspired by this Bollywood kind of imagery and emotional uh, relationship. So Vikram. Uh, so that explains it. You know, there is no great vision that somebody saw Kali and then he made a painting of hers or nothing. Like <laughs> so Vikram, I have, to, I have to say one thing. I guess we are kind, I'm so sorry, we are kind of running out of time, but before we actually end, I do want to spend a little bit of time. Actually, something Atre is saying is very interesting. He, she's, she's saying that Indian classical art and culture, it is an endless topic like an ocean. Thousands of webinars may require to cover one fourth area of this endless topic. I'm amazed with today's seminar and looking many to attend like this. So that, it just shows, I mean, the depth at which Vikram is trying to attempt it. And Debashish is saying, if I knew the answer, uh, what was it? If I knew the answer, what would you do, Debashish? <laughs> I'd go beyond the chicken and the egg, I said. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. So yeah. I can totally There, there is no answer. I mean, the, the no answer. Answer. actually, the, there are many answers possible. Yeah. But like you were saying that it, it would require many seminars and still you wouldn't exhaust the yeah, yeah. And then there is the psychological aspect because I work with psychology. Uh, however, I'm not going to say anything right now because it is something I want to attend to. So uh, Vikram, by the way, Fazia, who's our executive director, you have an offer from her. Uh, she is a faculty in South Asian studies in Princeton. So she's saying, I would like Vikram to make more films like this, focusing on other traditions where art and religion merge together. And I would be happy to be his assistant. So uh, it, I was thinking of exactly the same thing. I mean, we are talking about India and I was thinking, how about other countries and other religions? Do they have this similar kind of darshan aspect? Or uh, maybe a version of darshan aspect that has been modified in modern period? That would be an interesting thing to actually look at, right? So I, yeah, and I think, yeah. you know, uh, Swati, I think all religions have it to some extent. I mean, even, you know, uh, I mean, when we talk about aniconism, there is no aniconism with some amount of iconism. Mm. You know, even in Islam, you have the Kaaba, which is an icon. Everybody everywhere is going to prostrate looking at that direction. So it, it's, mm. it's a visible icon. It's a visual icon. Mm. A, a certain kind of darshan is being practiced there. Uh, you know, in, in Orthodox Christianity, it's, it's a visually mediated uh, experience. So a certain amount of darshan is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things with uh, the Indian tradition is that we've talked a lot about it. We've mm. actually put it into words. We've mm. created concepts around these things. Mm. They are articulate. Mm. You know. Yeah, and one thing I want to say, we have been talking about the content and what it means and we have been analyzing it, but let's not forget how beautiful the art is. The one that was shown in the movie, I, I thought that was stunning because sometimes there is a lot of it around you, you stop noticing it, but the movie really brings it to forefront and I experienced the same thing in the museum exhibition in Santa Barbara that you really realize the, the intricacies and the details and the way, you know, the artist has poured their everything in it. It's amazing. That part is amazing. Um, I am just trying to decide whether to let the question go on for a little bit or to end it. Uh, Lisa, you are saying she Jewish. That's another notion. There are no icons. I do not know why it's a religion of the book, but 
Lisa, I would like uh, Debashish to answer. Is there darshan aspect in that too? Darshan is an encounter, that experience of, this is my definition anyway, you correct me, Debashish, if I'm wrong. It's the experience of merging with whatever you are looking at on a spiritual level, on the level of maybe yeah. losing yourself. Yeah. yeah it, it is visually mediated. Darshan has to do with looking. Okay. Actually. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that all religions have to have darshan in or, or do have darshan in a major way. Uh, you know, you might privilege certain forms of relation. The relationship through the eyes, the eyes are the major sense that we have. It's, it's of the five senses, it's the most prominent sense. That's why, you know, the eyes are the faculty through which everybody tries to condition you. All our advertising is really bombarding our eyes. So, you know, in a way that becomes a medium through which the senses can merge with that which is beyond the senses. Mm. That's why it's done. And some religions have, uh, you know, kind of completely tried to closet it because the, the idea behind an, an iconism is that, or going away from iconism, is that if we uh, limit God in a form, uh, we've, we've uh, put a kind of a, you know, a, a, a finite to the infinite. If yes. something is truly infinite, how can it be uh, sort of limited to a form? Even if we say that there are a thousand forms in which it could be yeah. uh, contained. So that's why these forms have to go along with the texts mm. and the texts are problematizing the forms, mm. you know, because the texts that talk about these images are giving you other ideas about these images, that these yes. images really are images that merge into the infinite. It's the meeting place of the finite and the infinite. Yes. So that 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 uh, you know, it's it. You cannot take any of them separately. They are, they all exist together. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a really insightful answer, Debashish. I want to address one other comment that has been made by Roberta, uh, because I really believe in what she's saying. She's saying that it, Michael's question makes us think of Jung's process to uncover archetypes. And uh, yeah, that is a, I'm, because I have my, because of my psychology background, I also have affinity towards Jung. And the, she's saying the model is inherent to the collective unconscious. I mean, that may be what's happening there. So, uh, but then even if there is collective unconscious, the actual symbols you see are culture dependent. Uh, and I, in fact, uh, would like to now stop. I think that I have addressed everybody's questions, not all of them, but at least one of them. I would like to say that um, we all are born with different religions. We may not be religious, we may not be God believers, but we are all born into some culture or some religion. And we change, as we grow up, we change. We become more thinking type. However, I think that whatever we are raised with, we are like sponge that has absorbed water. And when you see the sponge, you don't see the water until you squeeze it and then the water comes out. So I am actually wondering about one question I want to ask Debashish and Vikram. You yourself may not be believers, However, when you were going through the process of making films, did the sponge get squeezed and did the water come out? Did you experience something that was somewhat extraordinary? A darshan of a sort. Oh, yeah, as, and, uh, Swati, I, you know, again, bringing in the question of belief really doesn't cut it. Yes. I think the, the metaphor of the sponge is nice because I think through our senses we are experiencing all the time and we are having uh, you know kind of numinous experiences or experiences that go beyond the senses also not necessarily only through religion but through our everyday experience we are having experiences that take us beyond the uh, beyond the senses and these places certainly have a charge 
uh, I certainly experienced my my great experiences through this uh, process were when uh, I came across the artists and they showed their art. I mean, it's just the relationship between the artist and the and the art that draws you into yes. uh, that that force field and takes you beyond the senses to that particular kind of experience. So that happened many, many times yes. for me. Yes, 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 absolutely. No, that's true. That is so true. Vikram, do you have anything? You had talked about your experience in Puri. I wonder if that's something you want to talk about or anything else. So over the years, you know, I've had this experience of feeling a forced field. Uh -huh. and the accumulated vibrations mm -hmm. of a site, of, mm -hmm. of a holy site or a sacred site, mm -hmm. or even uh, where they have uh, uh, in Arizona and other places, they have these things called vortexes, mm -hmm. you know, where you go into an area and mm -hmm. uh, there's a high frequency and uh, things can happen there. So, uh, I, I mean, I sense this in old uh, uh, religious sites, not just in India, but in other places. You know, you can feel it in the Chidambaram temple. Mm -hmm. You can feel it at Mount Mary's church mm -hmm. in Bandra, at the Ajmer Sharif. Uh, you can feel it at the old Shiva temples in Himachal Pradesh mm -hmm. uh, and other places. So, yeah, I definitely can feel the force field when I go into these yeah. places. I mean, I'm sensitive to it. You know? Yes, I yes, am sensitive. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So with that, actually, I'm going to now... Uh, wind the event down with Lisa's comment. She's, she's saying, I'm looking at Swati's bindi. Uh, this has to do with gazing in some way. <laughs> and so I think that's a good, a good point to actually end this discussion. And uh, one more time, time, please apologize us for not showing you the movie in its full glory. And it is on YouTube. For some time, quickly, right after you are done with this, go to YouTube and watch it again. Um, because it's a really beautiful movie. So I truly apologize. And thank you, Vikram and Debashi, so much for coming to Samanway and giving us this opportunity to talk to both of you. And in spite of this movie showing, I hope you keep in touch with us. And next time, I promise we'll investigate this further and make sure that it's done properly. And I really mean it. I'm not just saying it uh, to say it to you. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Swati. I just Thanks, wanted to Swati. say that the film is produced by the Center for Promotion of Indian Sacred Culture. And on your site, I think you have the, 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 the email or the website. Yes. People can contact us uh, for the movie if they're yeah. interested in the movie. Yeah. And as you said, it can be on your Facebook page for the next three or four days. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. You know, okay. And be, yeah, you could, you could keep it up and then yeah. you could put the link. So if people want to contact us for the film, they're welcome. Okay. So I'm going to ask Fazia. Uh, she's saying thank you. Uh, Fazia, can you just say last two sentences uh, to Vikram and Debashish to thank them? And to close this event. Hi. Uh, hi, Vikram. And can you hear me? Yes. yes. yes hi, Vikram and Devashish. I thoroughly enjoyed the session. And Swati was a wonderful moderator. And my mind is like, you know, kind of about to burst with all the stimulation that I have received from this conversation. And I have... You know, I did not ask a specific questions because I had too many questions. I did not raise my hand because I had too, too much to say. So hopefully that we can have another session on a related topic or any topic that you would like. And, uh, you know, you can come back to Samanwe. And as Swati said, that we would do a better job in terms of doing justice to uh, yeah. your, your, your work. Uh, and my offer, you know, to... Um, Kind of to assist assist you. I know that uh, Vikram, you probably have a lot of more qualified assistants, but I do think that just one last thing I would say that the way we are categor ca sometimes we categorize, you know, a particular tradition, you know, kind of tagging it with a particular religion. That is also something that we need to probably rethink. And I liked. Um, 
uh, Debashish's idea of uh, thinking of these traditions in terms of Eastern or Western or Indian or non-Indian than Hindu and Muslim and all that. So again, as you can see that I cannot just say thank you. I'm so <laughs> excited, <laughs> but we must end this session. Yeah, yeah. So thank you again for thank coming. You. And, uh, thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Fazia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank thank you, you. the whole audience. Thank you. Thank you.